trying to do that the old way with nine trucks driving around during the day and disrupting is just bananas. Um, so we took on the approach that trust us, give us your keys to your shop, and we will come around like fairies and we'll load your store so that when you walk in the morning, not only did you get it, but it's in the right place. There's a photo in your phone. So on your train ride into the day, you're not panicked. Do I need to run to the deli to get milk because the milk guy's going to be late? Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Sovereign Mesa Podcast. With us today, we have the great Dane Atkinson, founder and CEO of Odeco. Odeco is helping mom and pop coffee shops to compete against large chains like Starbucks or uh, Dunkin' Donuts through an all-in-one technology platform. In a way, Odeco is a culmination of a lot of the themes and ideas that we've been discussing in this podcast and that at FJ we've been investing over the last couple of years, mostly around the future of work of leveraging technology to let small business owners to do what they truly love um, and outsource the rest in a more efficient way, um, the SME opportunity, and how to provide a really unique, magic-like experience for for customers. Um, so I'm really happy to have you here, Dane. And by the way, before I forget, congrats on the announcement of the Series D, $53 million. That's impressive. Um, happy to have you here. Welcome. All right. So Dane, um, I've had other serial entrepreneurs in this podcast before. I don't think I've had serial CEOs and entrepreneurs before. Uh, <laughs> you've been successful with many of your companies, but also as a CEO of companies that you haven't started, like Squarespace. Today's a, a couple billion dollar company, public company. Um, tell us more about your background and, and what got you inspired to start in the entrepreneurship and technology space. Um, well, happy to be here. Thank you. And a nice warming question to get going. I don't know whether it's great to be like the longest held CEO title or whatever you might give me, but I'll make it. Um, I mean, it was a natural calling to me, right? Like I have ADHD and abundance of energy. I don't really fit into a structured environment such as a corporation or, you know, government or anything else. So this was really only one of the few roads I could take. Um, and started as a teenager, built my first company in my teens. Got to a decent sized company in my late teens. You're right there. I, I enjoy the espresso the drinking, <clears throat> which my is God. like definitely on brand. I'm alive. I'm alive. Ah, almost died there. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I know, you know, views are important, but you don't need to sacrifice yourself. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, but I was saying, like, I think that, you know, entrepreneurship is a path that some people have as their only real path. It was certainly for me. Um, so I got to start out really early on, uh, which meant I could make the idiotic mistakes we all make for years and years and years, and finally get to a point where I'm making less of them. Um, so as you noted, I think I've had a half dozen companies or more than I've been the founder of and been CEO of a number of others, and then tried to give horrible advice and on occasion good advice to a lot of other folks in this game. Um, one, of, awesome. one of the things that stood out um just for anybody looking at your LinkedIn, if they scroll down and see what happened in the you know late 90s or early 2000s, they'll see a bunch of things that you did at the same time, oftentimes. You know, you started yourday.com, yourstop.com, and many other things. Was that uh, by design? Was that part of a you know, grand plan um, given this new platform shift of the tech glory days in the 90s, 2000s? Or, or, or was it more, you know, I'm... I'm, I'm putting bluntly, just throwing spaghetti at the wall, th see what happens. And I think that's the best way of, of going about a new platform shift. Um, it's an interesting question because I, I definitely did not learn focus at the beginning of my career. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I don't think I would ever do that now and I have it for the last decade or so. Um, but then it was very hard not to see fixing everything and jumping into it. And I think I'd owned a bar the same time of your day and your stuff. And the internet had gone this first real rise. Um, and we've been slugging along since the beginning of it in my first company, which had gotten pretty big. We had you know, offices across the globe and, and we built some core tech that was like this in, intranet, which is a lost term. That was like kind of an internal support system. So we spun out of it, your stuff, which was like a, a pre-seed Google Drive and your day, which was a pre-seeder to Google Calendar, way the hell beforehand. Um, and we raised, which we thought was a fortune, like a million dollars for each. 
which was just like, it took forever the first time we raised money. And then I was like, oh my God, you could raise money overnight. What are you doing? We've got to do all these things. Um, and we sold them pretty successfully. I think like they had very short lifespan, like four months, I think nine months before we sold them. Um, and it depended on providing a lot of economics to the company that we spun them out of because we went into the crash, the great first crash of 2001. Um, so it's kind of beneficial. Uh, and each of those, I think I made every mistake you can make. Uh, we hired a supermodel, Letitia Costa, actually, to be like the the alert sounds. And we, uh, um, <laughs> we had like printed campaigns. And like, oh, it was just um, <laughs> was so foolish. Uh, but, you know, the tech worked and it found a home. Um, so it was, you, it was a good you mentioned experience. You mentioned the, the crash of the dot-com bubble. What what was it like to be in, in a founder's shoes uh, back then? And, and do you see any similarities with what we're going through right now? Actually, I think the 01 crash for what we are facing in the tech space is the most close comparable. Because um, 08 and some of these others, they were definitely downturns, but they weren't as an ice over. Like, I think in that first cycle, there are other compounding things. Like we had a kind of a war too. We had 9-11 shortly after, you know, we now Ukrainian war, like we had a lot of common just distress in the human system and the investment community got spooked back then. So they'd been incredibly active and they went dry and they went dry for years. It wasn't just weeks and months and, um, and a lot of other things, the system collapsed, people stopped spending money. So all the advertising dollars got pulled and a lot of the internet back then was dependent on the ad dollars and that kind of ecosystem building up. So revenue just froze. Um, and it was really hard and it was a good lesson for me. And we ended up selling our company during that process because we couldn't navigate the other side. And I think the lessons I got from that was endurance is really important and reacting very fast to crisis. Um, so in these latter days of Odeco, we took it very seriously when we saw the market conditions changing last year and made a lot of very hard choices and prepared to last for years under the impression that sometimes these cycles don't new shape right the market doesn't come back it's just the new market right like it's just the new day we're living in not like in some sort of that's, massive curve th that's an interesting point because especially here in the us we're used to these uh boom and bust cycles and like this conviction that at some point it'll come back um i think that's broadly the case it's just a matter of which time frame are you picking but some yeah. of the things that you've seen in 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 the 90s and early 2000s in the tech world uh, the time that we we're talking about did not come back uh, or some of them, some of the areas or verticals came back in a different way. Do you think we're going to see something similar right now in which things that we saw in 2020, 2021 might not come back in the same way, let's say in five years? Absolutely. Um, I think it's a false impression to think it's fast. One of my own triggers when everyone says it's never going to go down, it's going to go down. Eventually, when everyone says it's never going to come back, it will come back. It will come back in five, 10 years. But like it was in 2001, all the froth died almost instantly. And then a new class of companies got born, an epic class, right? The class that is still the titans of the world today, Google and such. Because if you were building in that post-crisis climate, you're building with frugality and consciousness up front, and you were trying to make a non-venture back business model, right? That's something that just could get its own traffic. Um, and even for them, it was hard. A, a friend of mine turned down putting a million bucks into Google at a dinner party in his first year when they were desperately searching for the million dollars. Like it was actually hard for them to raise money too, because it was just such a hard time. Um, I think what happens now is the same thing. There'll be an amazing class of companies that are built now. And the companies that do manage to navigate this period tend to become really strong durable entities because they've shown flexibility from hyper growth that was the rage two years ago and just try to add customers at all costs to actually running a healthy business and if you can balance those two things out probably make a pretty interesting business do you think it's um, less of a of a uh this type of businesses will not exist and more of this type of founders of mod or modus operandi will not exist irrespective of what you're building both so there are a lot of business models that existed because the CAC LTV was so distorted by venture money, right? So when that flips over, if you're subsidizing your customer to gain ground, that subsidy doesn't exist. And that doesn't mean if you take like a, 
last minute delivery, right? Like it doesn't mean there isn't a use case for, I got my kids that want to kill me. I need to get this for a party. I need an hour. Um, but the volume of it's going to be very different. So the models that were built on that potentially could adjust and find a space that's meaningful, but a lot of those models just don't work. And they can't in this time. Um, and if companies have the agility, they'll end up doing something interesting. If they don't, they won't make it. And the same thing for founders. There are a lot of founders, and I mean, I screwed this up. I was supposed to go public right before, a month and a half before the crash. Actually, we were filing for a public offering. And that was in my early 20s, late teens. Like it was super, it's like a kid, hit the jackpot. I was gonna make something gigantic. And then everything evaporated. And I just sat there with my mouth hanging down for months, not knowing what to do. And uh, turned down offer after offer to buy the company because it was like, uh, it can't be. It can't, I can't have gone from being this potentially interesting thing to nothing. And so I basically had to chase, I had to chase the landing for the company because as soon as I finally realized it, was in, it wasn't this bounce back and I wasn't going to get the thing I thought I was going to get, I couldn't catch up to finding an M&A deal. I couldn't catch up because the market had changed so quickly. Um, so I think that it's, to your point, there are founders who are, probably hoping that things are going to change and that's going to be tough on their businesses and their models that were just never designed for this climate. And that's also tough. Um, but these shakeups, there's, you know, there's babies in bath water, some excellent companies are going to die. Um, but there will be such a good class that gets created in these years. Right. Cause at the same time, it was very hard to build things because you had this incredible oh competitive dynamic. It's hard to games. build and hard to invest. I, I agree with you. It's, it's, it's oh, tough, but it's pretty exciting right now now in, it's in a different way really exciting um and it's also you know from the investor side from everybody's side like it's this, again where legendary choices are done especially when they're counter um heard yeah. right like when you start making your own decisions so yeah, yeah i'm excited for it it's tough and it's hard and i feel very privileged that i got to screw up enough to see the pattern <laughs> and hopefully not screw it up move again. fast yeah i didn't try to move where, fast. where does coffee uh, fit into your background like to me coffee is and i'm, I'm drinking my my I, well i was trying to sip my coffee before almost uh, before i choked <laughs> to death but <laughs> um it's uh it's uh, the, the coffee and the cafe culture is very dear to my heart the this very conversation we're having is trying to mimic that sort of romanticism of cafe culture uh where does it fit in your background how did you get into the into the coffee world um well the broader truth is I love small business I mean, I love with a dying passion. I think that the, I read this book when I was a kid, Neuromancer, which is a fantastic concept, but it had these corporate states that were actually stronger than government states. Like they just became these massive, you know, Googles and IBMs and the world just looked that way. And it's such a scary world to think of walking down the street and seeing Chick-fil-A, McDonald's, Burger King, Chick-fil-A, McDonald's, Burger King, and not having um, the color that is existing there. And also I think this human connection is super valuable. So when I was building my earlier companies in the same period, and I said, I opened up bars because I wanted to be around people and you, and you move zeros and ones all day as you weren't. Um, I opened up a coffee shop in Williamsburg in the early 2000s because I thought it'd be a great way to get connected to that community. Um, I didn't run it really well because I suck because I've got ADHD. So like, that's a tough business. So I had to turn it into a bar after four years um, just because it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, but I have a lot of love for that space and um, That's great. Really and let, let's not let's not get into Odeco because I want to do something uh, sure. different here today. I Ooh. typically give a brief introduction of 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 what the company we're talking about is, but I don't want to bore you with that. And uh, you've agreed kindly enough to mm -hmm. do a pitch, like a mini pitch, like a, a, a five ten minute version of an old using an old deck that you had. I think it would be good first of all to introduce the listeners to Odeco. But most importantly, at this point, I sat through hundreds or maybe even thousands of pitches uh, throughout my career. And I can safely say you're one of the best fundraisers I've seen. And it's not only my opinion. Uh, you know, you've raised hundreds of millions of dollars. So I think it would be great to listen a five-minute pitch from you or whatever, whatever it takes, and then sort of dissect um, some of the key things for a pitch to be successful. Um, sure. Do you want to you share your screen, uh, Dane? Yeah, happy to. And awesome. I'm happy to talk. notate as I go through this, just to um, Perfect. provide some color on the pitching style of things. Also, Odeco is not at all what this pitch is going to be because it's never something that I find a lot of early founders get fixated on. It's just the need to have the perfect business. 
and then the fixation that that's the business, it's never, ever, ever the first idea you have. <laughs> never. So like that desire to be so focused is dangerous. It's more of an exploration, right? Like you have an idea and you've got a customer you give a shit about. You want to spend your life trying to make them better. Um, and now all of a sudden, uh, this deck is 2019. Uh, we're four years old. So this was literally the deck I ran around with at the creation of the company. And we've been playing around with the idea a little bit beforehand because I'd sold my last company to Two, two Sigma. So um, this is kind of the aspirational story. You ready? I'll try to go fast because I think there's like 4,000 slides in here. So I'm just going to go through quickly, and try to make it a five minute. Um, so first off, expressing the size of the world that we are playing in is always helpful. So the way we did this was like, everyone forgets how big food is. Food is monstrous. It represents a mass portion of the general economy. And food out of home, like food in a coffee shop and a burger joint, is literally a quarter of the entire economy, right? So as you think about what an opportunity could be, we think there's a really interesting space that's not been addressed fully by tech that can be serviced underneath it. So I'm sure I'm like, a, basically, this is the lotto ticket slide, right? How big could this all be? Um, also show a durable trend that we're catching up on, right? Nothing sells better in a way than seeing that there's some momentum in the market you're catching. And this is true for our space, like food is just continues to grow. People wanna spend their money outside with friends. They wanna socialize. They no longer cook seven meals a week at home. They like they spend time going out in those coffee shops. And that's a space we think could really be improved with some technology. Um, we picked coffee shops to start with. And this is a hack that I've used in all the companies is try to pick one thing you can do really well at and narrow the problem. So it's kind of the metaphor of we're shooting for the stars, but we're working on the launch pad right now. And coffee shops to us was a fabulous customer to focus in on. And it's paid off incredibly well as we've evolved because it's turned out to be such a wonderful people to service. But even back then we were talking about just how they are very consistent, that they're adopting technology and these POS products that have never been adopted at speed, that they have a lot of similarity shop to shop and it'd be a really good place to put ourselves. Um, we then picked inventory. And I probably preamble this a bit by being like our first product that we launched with was the predictive AI, because we had this huge machine learning loop in our last company. And we were able to focus it off the POS data to sort of help a single customer. So looking at a customer, we could predict the future. And then what do we want to use that prediction for? And at the very beginning, we actually thought about a lot of these things. We thought about using the prediction to help them manage their communications and their labor. But um, inventory seemed to be a big part of the problem. And to our shock, there was no technology really present throughout the QSRs that were managing inventory, managing procurement, managing supply chain, any of that kind of stuff. So maybe not the sexiest thing on the upfront, but it was just really needy. Um, our early research with customers that we started talking to showed a purely paper-driven world, right? Um, like they're literally still today, four years later, when we walk into a shop, they're using paper and pen to track their inventory. Some of them have advanced to Google Docs, but for the most part, it's just as old as can possibly be. And it is such a mess, right? Like the excess that they have to throw out because there's no you know, visibility into it, the time it takes them to manage the 10 vendors, all this stuff um, really, really makes it hard. And if you're in a small coffee shop and unlike Starbucks, who's never really running out, when you have poor inventory, you lose money. You scare your customers away. They never come back to you. Um, this is what actually turned out to be much more of a Deco's true vision as we got into it. But we looked at this world of how logistics were fragmented for the small business and that every single small business, even when we first started with just the predictive model, was dependent on this broad ecosystem of vendors. And each single one of those vendors had its own P&L, its own sales team, its own collection team, its own fleet, its own everything, right? And the repetitiveness of that was such a cost to the environment, to the shop, to everybody. Um, so we knew there was an opportunity uh, to sort of help figure out even the back end, even when we started just as a prediction. Um, this actually picture here is famous in my heart because it was a keystone moment for us when we decided to really lean in more on the inventory. I was sitting in the shop in Spruce Street with a coffee owner. And in the middle of the rush, some guy comes in literally with this truck loaded of stuff. And the barista had to stop serving a customer, run out and grab an invoice, pretend that they're looking at it, take the products, put it on the chairs of the customer and run back and try to service it. And 
Like even if we have an incredibly intelligent AI, this is a problem we also have to solve. So we started realizing that the problem was bigger than we had thought of, right? And that, you know, when we'd go out and see how these shops bought, they would go to Jetro and fill up their, you know, <laughs> wagons with stuff. It was like, it's the 1300s. And in order to run your store, you would walk off to the farm and bring stuff back. Like the fact that the independent business was going through it was just mind boggling. Um, this has become a lot of our background, but again, we sold it very differently when we first pitched it, but it was just the idea that there is no data synchronicity across the entire system, right? Like if you think about it, the cafe is guessing the consumer behavior, the distributor is guessing the cafe behavior, the manufacturer is guessing the distributor behavior and the farm or makers guessing the manufacturer's behavior, right? So like everyone's guessing, there's no data layer, there's no communication, there's no single point of transaction, right? You can have a credit card ding five times to get one transaction from a customer. Like it's bananas how inefficient it was from a tech standpoint um, and how much we figured there could be an improvement just to how things worked. So this is our first, like how we would fit in is that we would make the predictions on one half and then we would work with a vendor ecosystem on the other half. And that together uh, using that kind of intelligence, we could make a better world. Um, and that stayed through to this current day, but it was much more as we started, not knowing how much we'd have to build physical infrastructure to succeed, that we would be able to uh, leverage the tech we already had to make a smarter system. Um, always good to have a few early customers. We had this in the few months before we escaped our hedge fund days and became our own company, just showing mm -hmm. how, you know, talking to a customer, how excited they would be to see us as a platform and um, some testimonials also super important and is also this customer uh, seeing them tomorrow i see them almost every week like your first customers are amazing and uh, knowing how much of a difference you can make in someone's life and having good people to work with is awesome and um, also helps really i think illuminate the story uh stats um our stats are obviously much more impactful now that we've gone into it but just showing like <laughs> how you are making a difference to a customer because it really is the magic that drives everything and we did, even in the predictive model stage, we made a lot of benefit for our shops um, before we started getting warehouses and trucks and drivers and everything else. Um, trying to get to a perfect level where they never worry about everything. There's never a data hole. There's never an out of stock. There's never a problem like that. Could be done with technology. And then just if we do make this work, and this is something, um, one of our first investors was a guy named Lee Fixel, who used to be a tiger. And uh, He's an addition he, right now, yeah. He's an addition, good friend, been a great uh, advisor this whole journey. His, uh, and the, the pitch to check was like 10 minutes. With him, literally. And he was like, <laughs> all I do is look at the moat, right? Like if you do this, it's very hard to see someone saying, I don't want to have a smarter system do all this work. I want to go back to that paper and pen universe. Like it's a quantum shift. So building a moat that's hard to get around is very valuable. Um, these economics actually turned to be more impactful than we originally modeled, but we were showing that like, as this ecosystem works, there's just a huge amount of inflation in the way things are, right? If you take that old visual of everyone having to buy it and resell it and buy it and resell it in a pipeline, that drives up the cost hugely. And that a single shop never had any leverage, never had any power. It was kind of showing the impact we could have with a shop. Go to market, went totally wrong. We actually didn't build a sales team <laughs> a little while ago, but we had the, you know, the standard slide of like, oh yeah, we have tools that we know how to make work. Um, one thing I think a lot of people do when they pitch it's dangerous is they try to sell how they're gonna use money. Most people don't wanna know how to use money. They wanna know that you've got targets you're gonna to go to and kind of if you get to join the family, the next what evolution of your family you? is gonna, right. And so you don't wanna know what the tile cost and the sink cost. You wanna know how the home value improves when you make an investment in your bathroom, right? Same thing for uh, even a tech company. So showing how you're able to scale in there makes a difference. Team, obviously I have an immense benefit. I've got gray hair and I've wiped out and made giant companies before. So like- people... I'm surprised you didn't include this slide at the beginning, especially given your it's background. A, it's a bit of an artifice because most people I get to meet with know me or at least yeah. have come okay, in from a place sense. where they, they're like, that guy's done something, right? Because it's had a couple companies that are big and whatnot. Um, so we, usually, and even in our modern deck now, because we're talking to late stage growth funds that don't have awareness of our past as much. That's we have where you put slides it. Slides upon slides, yeah. like here's the crazy team we assembled. In these early days, hopefully a lot of people get to meet people who have built some kind of rapport. But yeah, yeah it is about the team. And investing in the stage is almost always about the team. Um, some ideas of just how we would push things. 
and a recap of like why we give a shit because we do. <laughs> Again, that's that's through cut. And, you know, when I look at helping companies and the rest, it's it's this is not easy gig, right? Like the stuff's not easy. You have to be crazy, or you have to be in love with what you're doing, and showing that you actually care about something, and that you don't mind this being the tombstone at the end of your life. It's where you spent your time. It's a good sign that there's a, a shot at that investment from working. That's that's okay. super helpful, Dane. And and this was obviously very artificial. And I don't know what's your experience with other pitches you've done, but. The ones that I sit in are full of questions and interruptions. And I, like this time, I just, you know, remain quiet and silent just to give it a go. But I would honestly just jump at it right from the get go, asking a hundred questions. And people oftentimes have a deck and they stick to it like glue. But then, you know, people take you out other places and ask questions. And like, if you had, you have to be prepared to, to deviate from whatever your plan was. I mean, I personally hate decks. I'm um, not a structured, <laughs> instructor thinker, and I only use them at the partner meeting when you get to that space where you yeah. kind of want to have rail through. But I always welcome an engaging question. And I think showing agility as you move through your materials also shows like a degree of, you know, comprehension. Like when someone asks For a question sure. and you're like, I will deal with that on slide 17. Yeah, That's exactly. really yeah, an yeah. unsatisfactory answer to a billionaire who happens to be spending the hour yeah. with you. Like, you're like, yeah, that's a huge part. How are we going to deal with this? This is at least the thought we have. It may not be the right one, but here it is. And you can you can get off on that. And and I think I think also a really big mistake that folks make and something that I often try to coach towards is these are people you're going to be married to, right? As you pitch these things and that you're, you're actually demonstrating that dynamic up front. So if you are presenting, right? Like here is my story. Ask me a question. Of, oh, here's my answer. I know what I'm doing. Totally bad, right? Because the theory is, as an investor, I'm actually clever. Maybe I'm not clever, but at least I have access to information you don't because I have a ton of companies, right? So I actually would like my portfolio companies to give a shit about the thing I can share that I've seen in the market. So when you counteract a point, kind of often make yourself less um, likely as a successful partner, right? But when you both turn around and you're like, you know, you're right. I don't think we figured out the CAC yet. Have you seen anyone in SME get a better formula? Then it's what you would like to have as a relationship with the board members are looking at a problem trying to solve it cooperatively versus being like, oh, our CAC is established. It's 369. We've got a method. And it's like, <laughs> I, that's great. But, you know, <laughs> let me Dean, tell you what I've seen. And what, what are, there, there has been certainly uh, a lot of evolution, not only on the financial metric side, but also on the model side. And you sort of alluded to the vertically integration of, of some of the operations. And, and I would love to spend some minutes on some of the impressive things that you're doing right now, especially around, you know, the coffee deliveries in the middle of the night. I, I think that's, that's something that blew my mind uh, when I first heard of it. Can you, can you walk us through that experience from the small owner's perspective? And, and you gave a perfect example of how, how it was done before. And then maybe some of the more uh, hidden benefits from the Odeco point of view or from the financial point of view as well of doing the deliveries in the middle of the night? So we found pretty early on, as I was saying, that that what a coffee shop and an ice cream shop really needed, they need to be part of an infrastructure, an invisible franchise that's not making them change their wall color. And where we live now, that's making sure that they start their morning with the right stuff to sell, the right amount of everything else. Trying to do that the old way with nine trucks driving around during the day and disrupting is just bananas. Um, so we took on the approach that trust us, give us your keys to your shop, and we will come around like fairies and we'll load your store so that when you walk in the morning, not only did you get it, but it's in the right place. There's a photo in your phone. So on your train ride into the day, you're not panicked. Oh, I need to run to the deli to get milk because the milk guys. How do late. people react when you ask a single owner, hey, just hand me the keys of your store? And that's their store, their owners, that's their life. Like, how do people react? I mean, in New York, we have 1,400 sets of keys we've gained in the last two years, which is like four times the size of Starbucks. So it's gotten to a place where people are pretty trusting that we aren't going to steal their express machine <laughs> and mess things up. In the beginning, it was it was harder, right? Like it was, it was a bit of a question for shops. It's almost too good but, to be true, no? It's like, okay, hey, you're coming in at night and and stocking my shelves, and I'll come in and I'll see everything shining and ready to go. Yeah, there's a, there is still even today a lot of like it, where it's the hidden catch. Yeah, right? what's like the catch? Will, right, like and there is because unfortunately the way the ecosystem worked historically is you'd have a lot of people bait and switching. We heard this great term called speeding 
from Cisco where they would like, you get caught if you try to inflate the cost too fast because then you get actually mm. the customer realizes you're adding fees in. Um, and I'm, I think when people first saw us, they're like, cool, but are you going to charge me a $3,000 lock fee at the end of the month or something? Like, I, I kind of want to see this play out. Um, but from an impact standpoint, we won the, you know, environmental award in New York. We've done a lot of uh, huge shifts, just how that works, because taking, I think it's 900 trucks a day are no longer on the city streets at this point. Like, it's it's a massive detox of a it city. It makes to total have. sense, right? Even for, even financially, like, you don't have speeding tickets. You don't have to, you know, spend a lot of time just waiting, stuck in traffic. It, it makes it's, so much uh, sense. Our, our drop costs are a third or less of what an average distributor was, and that we have you know much bigger basket because we've taken all those trucks into one truck. Um, and our load times are wickedly fast. We can do 30 plus drops in, per vehicle at night, which is really hard to do if you're driving a CDL around Manhattan during the middle of the yeah. day. Like you're lucky to get to six or seven. Um, so it's been, it's been a really good formula. And also from a coffee shop standpoint, no one really ever says thank you to them. I mean, we all do when we get our coffee. No one's like, we love the fact that you're making this community better, right? And us being able to come around in the middle of the night and make it so that when they start their day, it starts off well. And right now we're, you know, 99% on time and um, we're almost 95% everything's perfect in the order, which is in an industry that's in the 80s and 70s, it's a big lift off the shoulders of these shops can to have us, it. Dean, can you give us a sense of how big Odeco is today in terms of the impact? Because, uh, and we're going to talk about the the invisible factor in a little bit, but you guys are invisible because I go to Maman or Joe's Coffee oh, and oh, even customers. though you, you no, know, I know, I know. So even though you guys supply a lot of the, of the, of the inventory to them, I've never, you know, if I'm a customer, I, there's no reason I could hear about Odeco. So like how, how many, um, coffee shops are you servicing today? Which cities are you in in the United States today? Just give us a sense of of orders of magnitude um, uh, of size today. I mentioned very fast, right? So we started this really after COVID, so two and a half years ago, um, and we had fifty shops. We're now touching fourteen thousand shops across the country, so That's about crazy. a third of the industry. And we physically went from one market, and then about a year and a half is ago, that a two third? Years ago, a th a third of non-chain coffee shops or a, or a third yeah. of the coffee shop industry? No, a third of the non-chain coffee shops. I don't That's know, insane. Know right now. Um, we're in 16 physical cities with buildings. Uh, we went from a team of 17 to 500 in the course of the last two years. Like it's been, a, it's been a lot of growth and we, and to your point, we kind of try to stay invisible. Um, we also just fundamentally like doing the same thing for a lot of companies have been lucky enough to be in like Squarespace. You don't always know what Squarespace like. And always know it was, you know, somehow you, we're kind of trying to make the magic of the shop stand out and not make them feel like they're part of some kind of franchise that they're really are Joe Coffee, right? Joe and Maman feel very different, yeah. totally different. Um, but we're still the fairies in the night for both of them and make sure that when they start the day off, they start off right. So it's like, like it's, not, it's not for us to take that world, it's for us to make that world possible. Um, I, I would and we've like been really to lucky. Be... We've, we've been. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I'm just saying we're, to your point, you know, people have bet on us, have given us an absorbent amount of capital. Uh, we've been able to really weather this storm and kind of push through and continue to grow. And yeah. Execute on the plan. Uh, what I want to pick your brain on this model and like just taking a step back and thinking through the evolution of software, if you want. Um, decades ago, it was just make software. That's it. And, and make whatever you can and make it, and make it efficient. Then 2010s make software beautiful or better, or, or um, it's a continuation of that trend. And there's a new trend emerging a couple of years ago, including, and Odeco is part of that or a pioneer of that, is the make software invisible. And so there's a couple of companies, obviously with intricacies and differences, but like Slice could do something similar to pizzerias, yep. Joe Box for Locksmith, uh, Improvy, which was part of this uh, podcast doing for painters, and so on and so forth. Fresh up for uh, beauty salons. What's your view on this sort of model? And I don't think it has a name. We call it at FJ sort of future of work because, you know, small business owners are empowering technology. Like what's your view on this broader model that you guys are part of? I think it's, it's the right part of the life cycle for it, right? Like in those prior chapters, there was such a dreadth of tooling that anything you threw out of the internet would make sense. Now with 
CAC and LTV ratio is getting hard and everyone building feature sets, you really want to solve a problem, like a whole problem, a whole customer's issue. Um, and in many of those cases, you don't want to become the displacer of that ecosystem. You want to enable it, right? So you don't want every salon to have the same logo on it because it's not what's going to work in the consumer base. It's not what's going to enthuse a person to come to the in their shop every day and put that extra 10 hours in like it has to be enablement um and i think that there's there will be a class of companies that have really committed to those customers that'll make it work i think there's some risk in the embedded finance and things that aren't really deeply in but if you're truly saying i'm going to make the pizza shop work and alir and slice truly want to make the pizza shop work and these businesses that are really trying to make that they will continue to build out a stack that actually enables these folks to really succeed uh, in a market that's very competitive. Like again, the foundational thesis for this chapter is the anti-neuromancer, right? We don't want corporate states. We want individual people to have their own destinies, dreams, successes and failures and everything else. And if we, as a class of companies can level that playing field and take this fantastic power that global has and franchises have and, you know, major companies have and make it work on a small basis, hmm. it's a, significantly better society, better invention, better health, better care. And like one thing that we love about Odeco, and if Odeco gets to make it to the public gateways and continue for an ever company, is that we have customers that actually give a shit. Like no matter how we angry our shareholders will end up getting and saying, you should make Oatly cost twice the price and you should screw the environment, our customers wouldn't tolerate it, right? So we have a, we have a great balance against the corporate structure, which tends to make these giant machineries eventually make choices that aren't aren't good for the planet and for people, where we can have a guardian and the companies this class that actually care. There could be this interesting, not just successful way of companies that lift these communities up, but actually companies over the next decades that are really responsible and more productive for society. So I'm a huge believer and glad that we're part of that group. I'm glad that FJ and everybody else has sort of totally. seen that future. Help us. Totally agree. And, 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 and we've been betting on this, on this mega trend. Um, with you guys and all of the companies I just mentioned, the the flip side of that, I mean, the opportunities there, uh, I think the moat to um, your comment before around Lee Fixel's uh, comment, completely agree. This is so complex that the moat is incredible. Now on the flip side, these are hard businesses to pull off and a yeah. lot of things need to happen. So from a building at the risk of being too pres prescriptive maybe, but like if you had to give a couple of commandments to people that want to build in this space, in this model, uh, call it future of work or vertically integrated ops heavy sort of models, servicing or enabling SMEs, what things you need to really have right. And similarly, from an investor point of view, if you're investing in these, what's the leap of faith that you're making? It's like, I, Dane needs to really get these things right for this to, is it the acquisition? Is it the financing? Is it the retention? Is it the logistics, warehousing? Like what's the key piece? Obviously it's all of them, but if you have to just point pinpoint to a couple of them. I mean, I think that the two sides of the coin actually marry up. It, it's, um, it takes bravery to create a new class of company. And Odeco went through it in its early days when our investors and the future growth investors were looking at were like, it's not a SaaS. Get rid of the trucks, make it a SaaS, right? Like, what the hell are you doing? Like, why are you touching products? That's bananas. I can't tell you how many conversations I went down that road with. And um, it's very hard as an operator, considering that you're defining a new investment and investors are not used to that kind of class of investment. So there are folks like you guys who are taking that bet, but in general, they're swimming against the wind. And I did this in SaaS. Like when we first did SaaS, cannot tell you how much pressure it was like, are they going to stick? Are these retentive customers? How do you get them? Like, it's not software. There's no contract. There's no life, like two year enterprise, like, which sounds totally insane now because everyone wants it to be the SaaS format. Same thing. In 10 years, people are going to be like, how big is your moat? Can a salon get off your platform? Like, are you really owning the space? So I would say it's to the operators, you're going to have a lot of pressure and the North Star we use, and I think it's a North Star that tends to work is just find what actually works for the customer to create that magic moment. No matter how bananas it seems from a model standpoint and how much you change your gross margin profile and all these other kind of things that can scare people. If you make something that works, our customers are not leaving, love it. And they just, thank God, because it is market churn. We just keep on making money, right? Like it will push through. We'll get to the other side. Um, 
but it won't be easy. There, it will be many investors. Like if you get rid of your trucks, we'll give you a hundred million. Like just yeah. do that. Just go to the, I'm, I, I cannot tell you, we'll spin out a prop co. We're going to make a company that owns all those locations and you have the software company. It's gonna be great. I'm like, no, it's not going to work. Do you think that's the, that's the, mo the most tricky part is the logistics slash warehousing piece of, of the equation? I think for a lot of these companies, you can't solve these real world problems purely in the cloud anymore. That generation passed, right? And there is a way to build a website and transact online and do all these things. It's there to solve the problems they're facing now. It's the guy walking with the U-boat. It's the you know, customer who needs to have something to take out of the, you know, the building. It's these like real things. So you, you're at risk in your moat building if you try to be a thin layer. And I think it's harder to get traction. So I, I encourage um, really just understanding the problem you're trying to solve and solving that actual problem. Uh, Would you encourage entrepreneurs to start with that thin, softer layer and then slowly vertically integrate or just go, go for it from day one? So there's another, um, which is changing too, but there is this TAM problem that most investors have where they have this thesis that you've got to be applied against a giant TAM. And that's kind of why we had those slides in the beginning. They're like, look how big the TAM is, but it's actually a, it's a bullshit, right? Like if you, what was GE's TAM when it started, right? Like a company can expand and do amazing things, really solve an actual problem fully, even if it seems super narrow. So an advice to an entrepreneur is, when you find a customer and they're bleeding, don't say, well, I can solve the payment part of this little problem for you, or I can get you the thousand dollars loan you need, but try to understand what's actually happening and solve that. Cause you'll have a much deeper ownership and relationship that will last. Um, and you can't be displaced by the theoretical Google presses a button and they actually do the same thing you do. And then why you're still around, right? Like you, it'd be very hard, by no means impossible, but it wouldn't be a button press to knock us off the field because we need quite a few buttons. I think that's great advice. And, and, and you've had your late motif in, in your career has always been SMEs. And I think you, you know how to sell or how to deal with SMEs. And so if you had to extrapolate some of these lessons, uh, I think you sort of alluded to it here and there throughout the conversation, but it's don't go as broad and don't think you'll solve some of the issues and SMEs would love you. Just go fully and solve one very hyper-specific uh, problem fully so they can love you, right? Yeah, and, and to get on the soapbox, for SMEs, SMEs are the most beautiful, caring people on the planet. And they really want to make their little world better. They suck as customers uh, in the old conventional sense. They want the power of Oracle with the usability of TikTok, right? Like it's, it's this weird dichotomy of structures. You've got to get that formula right. And you have to, like we don't sell. We meet with a customer. We never say it's at night. Imagine how much less staff you spend stocking your shelves. You don't have to talk to 10 vendors. Imagine how many shifts you save because they can't calculate an ROI. It's just not something that they're, they've got so much shit going on. So we just say it's cheaper done. Right. But so I, which is an incredibly hard thing to actually pull off. So the advice is particularly in this SME market is you need to blow someone's socks off. I, there is no benefit in having a 20% improvement as a business to anybody, actually probably in the world right now, but a big company could actually look at you and be like 20% times our hundred million spend is actually pretty meaningful. For a small business, it's got to be earth shattering. You've got to literally crack up in the world that they live in to get their attention. And when you do, you know, Squarespace will, could go to the islands and never pay attention and still make money, right? Like Odeco will get shot because when you get the formula right, everyone wants to run to it because it actually works but it's not an easy one to get to. And it comes back to that same thing. You can't solve a bit of the problem and hope that the SME is going to recognize that it's a bit and they're going to cobble together the rest of it. You've got to go in there and say, this thing you do, gone, done. Future work on that one, we got it. Focus on you know your customers. Dane, and, and, and thinking forward, and you've mentioned a little bit, uh, hopefully in a couple of years, you'll you, you be a, a successful public company as well. But you also alluded to this being a new category uh, emerging in the private side. So we don't have a lot of comparables in the public markets. And we've seen how tough on margins these sort of tech-enabled ops-heavy models could be, even if they have tremendous modes. So how do you think, sort of putting on your, your investor hat or, or even prediction hat, how do you think these businesses will be valued in five, 10 years in the public markets? It, will it be based on... <laughs> 
EBITDA? <laughs> do they need to print money in the like? How how do we even look at these businesses in the future? It's an awesome question that uh, uh, we are at the forefront of. So we're lucky enough to have the Goldman's and JPN's and everybody like dream about what happens when Odeco goes public, and it's a shit show because our investors are like look like Shopify because who the hell doesn't want that multiple, right? But yeah. it's not true, right? It's so different um, than, than yeah. But do you look like Domino's? Do you look like Starbucks? Um, I think our guidance has been, at least as we talked to that like investor group, is probably better. And I think some companies have broken some ground on like Toast and all these others, but they, I think everybody tries to engineer themselves more into being a SaaS and looking that way, which I think is actually a deficit when you get in a hard time and the public market looks more closely at you. I think coming out there and saying, yeah, our model is actually a lot like Starbucks except Starbucks took 50 years and we could be there in five, right? And our margins are better because we're using a shit ton more tech than they are. I think the market's going to value us somewhere in that range between a tech company and one of those companies. Don't think they're going to give the discount. I mean, you look at Tesla, right? They're making fucking cars, but their multiples are multiples of astronomical by comparison. It's an extreme because they've got a personality and everything else. But I think that the, the market will look at this new wave of companies and think of them as, they're going to flip over existing markets, right? They could flip over the pizza market, the, st the salon market, the painting market. And those markets are huge. And if something can do that and actually meaningfully make a better world out of it, then they're probably going to get a value, not in the old days of, you know, 80 times revenue or something, or yeah. even no, or 20 times revenue, an, but still pretty With good. an incredible mode at the same time. So as opposed to saying, you, you start from Shopify and apply a discount like Toast might do, you start from the bottom of these established old school companies and like what's totally. the premium I can put on top? I just oversimplifying. Yeah. Started things. saying like, you know, they, those franchises have, you know, seven to 10 multiple and start there. And if we seem to be something nifty, we'll let it grow. I was thinking that people, it's the same thing as a TechCrunch article, right? Like we're all designed to feel like our TechCrunch article has to look like it's huge and big and big checks and big valuations. It's kind of all a lie, right? Same thing for going public. If you push your valuation in the first days, a really high bar to snooze around your CEO to say like now you got to grow from there. You know, be honest in each each chapter, be valued fair, and get to grow with everybody versus trying to overextend your story. Well, that's our hope. That's our, that we will help create the uh, space for everybody else. If we're lucky for sure. It's 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 exciting. Um, it's like sort of creating a category as we speak. It's great. Then you have um clients in both coasts, you know, in, in all, all over the country, but you know, you're based in New York, you're being a New Yorker your entire life. Um, if you, the same way we, we have differences between European coffee culture and, you know, American coffee culture, American being more fast paced, you know, they don't drink cups or don't, I, I don't drink cups. I, I'm based here. They're buckets, you know, they're huge coffees. Um, whereas, whereas in, you know, in Italy, it's a smaller, smaller ristrettos or whatever. Do you think, and don't take this question seriously at all, but do you think there's a difference between the New York coffee culture and sort of the SF or West Coast coffee culture at all? Do you see distinctions? Totally. Uh, it's not as dramatic as Italy <laughs> macchiato to a Starbucks macchiato, a milkshake, whatever else. Like, yeah. there's definitely a, but we, we are in, all, you know, 16 states and we actually have drop shipping to the rest of the country. So we sell to every place. And it's very interesting, the taste profile shifts. So go with the South, there's a lot more sugar, so a lot more syrups, a lot more flavors. Um, New York, if you compare New York to the West Coast, New York is um, very heavy black. It's a dark kind of culture. People like strong coffee. Um, and they have often like our drip sales here are from the shop standpoint, it's actually higher. West Coast, West Coast has much more plant-based, a lot more, you know, um, milk oriented cups like it's because there is definitely different tastes and it gets even more in nuance when you get into pastries and you get into like you know uh, bars and all the other things we sell even uh, grab and go right like um there's different personalities in each different city and some brands will actually travel really well because they're kind of new and hip and some brands really do resonate with one particular kind of market um which is mind-blowing so each of our buildings hit you visit hundreds of, of coffee shops, you know, every month. Do you, and so you have yeah. sort of a, a, a strategic point of view of what's happening in the coffee market from a flavor perspective, from a consumer, consumer behavior perspective. 
Are you seeing any green shoots, even if they're not fully formed yet, of emerging trends or thing you're, things you're seeing on, on the coffee world that you say, oh, this is interesting. I'm not sure it's going to be a thing or not, but this is certainly popping up as, as something different from before. Uh, there was a real push towards micro stores, um, less people doing third space, more people just getting a great quality. Uh, that's actually swinging back with so much unemployment, particularly in like tech quarters, people are actually needing the third space again. So we see large stores actually getting to be, which we didn't think was going to happen. We thought it was going to all generate more towards really great experience in the coffee, but not in the atmosphere for sitting. Um, but it's now spun the other way. Uh, Taste-wise, more exotic flavors are really catching on, which is kind of weird, like violet and stuff. We have syrups are actually starting to get very high spikes. Like people are, um, especially now if they don't have the office restrictions, because it used to be you had your home and then you had the office, and the office is slightly better stock, but it didn't have flavors, but maybe one or two. And so people are really pushing their tastes experimentally there. Um, shops are getting better at merchandising at last. They suck. Um, it's just a hard thing for them to get the attention to anything about, but they're starting to add in a lot of interesting adjacent items. Uh, it's also a way to kind of combat the basket size pressure that's out there with the you know economy stress is that trying to get other things that people are excited to be buying. Um, and we've seen that as far as like people actually adding like deli kind of products inside of shops just to kind of get that size going up, which is something that's very new and I think will have a longer term trend. Um, more booze. Most places, not in New York and San Francisco, but they're starting to add booze on coffee shops. So coffee shops kind of during the pandemic collapsed their staffing. So they would actually be able to only manage one shift. But as the market comes back, they're actually often adding a second shift and they're putting in liquor on that second shift. Is it somewhat of a powerful combo when you get down to it? Um, but that's a bit of a bigger trend that we're catching them. Okay, just to wrap up, final, final um, comments. Where can people find more about Odeco, about you? Um, we can wrap up with that. Um, I, I mean... Definitely find out about us on our site and, and go to a coffee shop, try to support small business, be an entrepreneur. One thing that everyone forgets is you always come out better. Even if you lost all your money, you come out better. So like somewhere in your life, try to do something on your own. It's a better way to be. 